Welcome to Checks and Balances. My name is James Blair. I'm not joined by Michael Vincent today. I'm joined by David Seymour, the leader of the ACT Party. David, yeah, James. welcome. Hey, thanks. Um, so you must be full into campaign mode now. Very busy man, I'm guessing, at the moment. Yeah, totally. It's, what, 43 days to go when we're recording this. So yeah. um, it's going to be uh, a pretty intense 42 days. I, I read in the Herald, I better put my flat jacket on because, um, you know, Labour can't run on like we did a good job so instead they're running on like those guys are really bad um so that makes for a negative campaign but hey look i'm, I'm proud of the values we stand for and more and more people signing up to them so that's a good thing yeah yeah definitely um a lot of uh, policy starting to come out and it feels like there's a lot of lot of momentum um so at lighthouse uh we've we've got accountants mortgage brokers and financial advisors but really it's all about how do we help kiwis get ahead how do we help them achieve their um, goals. So I've got a whole bunch of questions to talk to you about today, but I've got one that's not on the list that I want to ask you at the start. Um, when I think about uh, politicians getting in front of audiences and you know sharing their message, I go, podcasts would be a great place to be, but I barely see any politicians on podcasts. And I think it's one of two reasons, and you tell me if you think it's something else. One is um, maybe it's still that old school media mentality, or second, maybe it's just a relax long form conversations some are a little bit worried about getting into that environment why do you think politicians aren't using podcasts at the moment um well we are you can get the act podcast and um hear our, our version of it and it's exactly that it's a long form discussion so um i can't answer for all the other parties but uh, act most certainly has a podcast and uh, you can get the act podcast uh, wherever you get yours nice awesome okay so let's Jump into the questions. So the first one's around financial literacy, which is mm. which is a big one. So um, in New Zealand, we have poor financial literacy as as an average, um, and we're very underprepared for retirement. Um, like I said before, we believe in like financial literacy plus action plus enough time will help you kind of achieve your goals. Labor's come out and has said we want to focus on financial literacy and make it compulsory in schools in 2025. It sounds like National is um, supportive of that as well. Uh, what do you think of the policy? Um, I just asked, what does it mean? Like what exactly uh, is financial literacy? What will be taught? How will it be tested? Because um, anyone can come out and say, we will make all kids be financially literate. I mean, that's that's not a strategy. That's a, mm. a goal. That's a soundbite. Um, so how would we do it? I think that there is a need for a major upgrade of the curriculum. Labor's been taking knowledge out of the curriculum in a whole lot of areas, you know, bio, accounting, whatever. Um, and uh, I think we actually need to say, all right, hang on a second. What knowledge do we want one generation to the past to the next? And once we've figured that out, in each area, who are the experts? For example, the Chartered Accountants of Australia and New Zealand, so some of your people might be members of them, they were trying to have influence on the curriculum refresh through the Ministry of Education. Ministry of Education basically told them to sort off. Uh, so, yep, agree with the goal, but how do you do it? Uh, you get a community agreed body of knowledge that you want to pass on from one generation to the next. You ask the experts in the community to have input into that. Um, and I think if you do those things, uh, then you'll actually end up with a good set of knowledge, a way of testing it. And it goes from being you know, a soundbite to actually here's a strategy and how we're going to measure that it's worked. Mm, mm. I, I mean, the it'll take a long time, you know, if we're starting with kids in school at the moment, but to to get that education out. And you're right, it's all about execution, isn't it? Yeah, well, there's lots of things like that. It's like uh, having another harbour crossing. You know, the, <laughs> the best time to start was probably about 1980, but the second best time is now. Yep, yep, <laughs> yep, definitely. Um, let's talk about business confidence. So, you know, we, we deal with a lot of um, businesses around the city, in particular in Auckland. Um, business confidence, I think, is around, you know, negative 13% in, in the current index. And I saw your um, Instagram post today that the GDP um, uh, for New Zealand compared to other countries is is pretty dismal. Where, where are we going wrong at the moment? And how much of that is uh, what's within New Zealand's control versus, versus external factors, do you think? Um, well, when you're um, 158th out of 159, you can't really blame external factors because the other you know, 157 countries ahead of you seem to have managed. Uh, so that's the first point. And I think the current government have been very keen to blame 
things outside their control, foreign countries, the previous government that hasn't been there for six years, just about anything but themselves. Mm. Um, so I, I agree, we live in a global economy, the, the wobbles in China are challenging, inflation, COVID, those have been global phenomena, but it seems that we are doing comparatively worse uh, given those headwinds. The next thing I'd say is that um, there's basically three reasons why I think business is in a funk. One of them is just leadership. Uh, when was the last time that you heard the Prime Minister of New Zealand or a senior government minister say, you know what, business is a force for good. It's about four types of people coming together to achieve something they couldn't achieve independently. You've got your entrepreneurs with ideas, your investors with savings, your employees with time and talents, and you've got your customers with their needs. And those four types of people interact voluntarily as adults to produce something none of them could have done alone. Mm. Isn't that beautiful? Mm. Isn't that great human interaction? Isn't business a force for good? We don't hear that. Instead, just about every day, we hear that the government is introducing a new tax, a new regulation, a new inquiry, a new investigation. And the subtext is that business is somehow bad. You know, out there, they're up to something and we're going to, you know, they're not going to pull the wool over our eyes. We're mm -hmm. going to figure it out. Mm -hmm. uh, and if it means that we spend more money on a bigger bureaucracy to, to beat them down, um, then so be it. Now, I think that attitude and that leadership needs to change. Second thing is that the quality of government expenditure. So in raw figures, um, you know, the government's up about 56 billion in its annual expenditure over six years. If you do it honestly and you take out, you know, population's grown surprisingly fast in five years, about 300,000 people up. Um, inflation's been about 22% in that period. Yep. That still leaves 29% real inflation adjusted increase in spending per person. Mm. And are we getting more kids at school, more learning? Are we getting safer streets? Are we get are we better hospital? I mean, we're not getting anything like that. So when government's a third of the economy and it underperforms, that really drains the energy. Mm. And of course, now people are competing with government for loanable funds. You know, every time government borrows and runs a deficit, that puts up interest rates for everyone else. So, so that's a real problem. Um, the third thing is the amount of red tape and regulation governments put on business. So if you look at the basic problem, I think, with productivity in New Zealand, um, you know, you could, you could come at it lots of ways. But I'd say one of the main reasons, if not the main reason, is people are spending more time on compliance activity less time on productive activity. You only have to look at the triple CFA changes over the last couple of years, trying to work out how much you spend on dog food so you can get an extension on your credit card. I mean, every minute that people spend doing that instead of doing something that actually produces useful goods and services mm. is a minute that is lost to the New Zealand economy and to the people who depend on it for their well-being. So um, look, bad leadership, anti-business sentiment, uh, you know, poor quality government spending, lots of waste competition for funds from the Crown, uh, and then dumping a whole lot of red tape and regulation, that has, I think, put business in a funk. That's a lot. That's, yeah. that's, that's a lot that needs to be fixed. Where do, yeah. you, where do you start? Well, the great thing about defining a problem is you've half solved it. So, mm. I mean, first of all, you, you need leadership. So I just gave you what, what I think is what uh, political leaders should be saying. Business is a force for good. It's voluntary cooperation. It's being, trading value for value, getting stronger together. That's a positive. Um, I think we should hear that loud and proud from our political leaders because we're not going to get out of this otherwise. Um, second of all, the quality of government spending needs a major rocket up it. So, for example, um, at the moment, if you're, say, the chief executive of Ministry of Development, you know, you've got almost $30 billion budget of cash you're handing out. Um, if you get you know, more people offer benefit and sustainably into work, then you get paid the same. If you don't, you get paid the same. The whole of the NZX, every chief executive is on some form of performance pay, um, whereas, you know, at the moment, we don't really even have a clear goal setting or accountability between the minister responsible and the chief executive of the department. So we'd actually start putting some business-like disciplines into the way that government departments are run. Um, you've got to have that head for business in order to have a heart for people because it's the people languishing on the dole for longer and longer and longer because there's no case management because no one's got an incentive to do it. That's our real problem in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, increase the quality of government spending. And I could, could talk a lot about that, um, but I'll stop there for now. Um, and then in terms of regulation, we just need to get really tough on if someone in government wants to make someone jump through a hoop in New Zealand, they better know what problem are they trying to solve. And they better show it can't be solved any other way. They better show that there are benefits to the rule that exceed the cost. 
Otherwise, the default is you don't make the rule. Right now, the default is make a rule. Uh, people will jump through that hoop for years. It may never be got rid of. And as over time goes on, more time in compliance, less time in production, everyone's poorer, it is depressing. So, you, you know, really the, the answers are just the opposite of the, the problems. Uh, and we've put a lot of thought and detail into better quality performance out of, out of government departments, better rationale for making rules. And the other thing about that rulemaking is going through all the existing rules, all the rules in finance, asking the finance sector, what are the things that are really wasting your time? And then reconciling that against, well, what are the principles of good rulemaking? And then saying, look, a whole bunch of things just need to go, and they're going. Um, and we've shown how a government could get really activist about doing that uh, so that people can spend more of their time being productive. Yeah, I think, uh, and I saw your comments around the KPIs for the CEOs in, in mm. the, the public sector and some, you know, uh, mixed feedback on it as well. And as a, as a business owner, you know, if you don't have people who have KPIs that they're working towards um, with accountability, you know, in any aspect of life, what are you doing and where are you going? Mm. Well, that's well, that's exactly our objection. Is that um, you know, these the, the Ministry of Education, the Ministry of Health, Social Development, MB, Immigration is another classic example. I mean, you know, we are now trying to build you know world beating exporting firms, and the competitors that most Kiwi firms have uh, are overseas. Like, let's say you're in Christchurch and you're trying to build. Um, super cooling refrigerant, that, that's Fabrum, which is a very cool company. Let's say, for example, your main competitor is in Copenhagen. Well, there's 500 million people that could move to Copenhagen and work mm. there tomorrow under the EU. In New Zealand, well, you've got 25 million Aussies, 5 million Kiwis, anyone else, and the Aussies often don't want to come because they're already getting paid more. Yep. So anyone else is going to have to go through enormous rigmarole. So where is the... Where is the expectation on the chief executive of immigration that you do it fast, you get it right, and that you're actually making people feel welcome to New Zealand? Because that's what the Canadians are doing. Mm. They've got the welcome mat out, and um, New Zealand needs to wake up its ideas. You know, people aren't queuing out the door anymore, um, and, and, and we just go and shut, slam the door in their face anyway. That, that's that's not a pathway to building successful companies that raise wages. Yeah, I mean, I talk to a lot of business owners. Uh, big and small mm. and the the same thing I hear all the time is just trying to find good people um, yep. and the restriction in terms of I could grow to X but I just can't get there yep. and on the flip side we're now talking to a lot of people who are planning to move overseas for lots of different reasons um, some was the COVID kind of you know hadn't been able to go mm. some are going for opportunities mm. the other piece which is growing is probably the frustration around feeling New Zealand is, is going backwards um, when it comes to that piece, uh, there was a net migration loss of 10,200 people to Australia um, from last September. And the numbers, like if you if you look at what you can earn in Australia compared to New Zealand as well, you talk about nurses mm, and teachers, mm, it's very mm, common, mm. common sentiment. We need smart people here who want to be here, who are excited about building building mm. a life here, mm. which has a direct impact to, to mm. businesses and their ability to grow and prosper. Mm. Mm. Um, what... Do all of the issues that you've spoke about and how to fix those, do, that, do they naturally mean that people want to stay and, and build a life in New Zealand? Like how, how do we get people to be excited about building a life in New Zealand? Well, it's it's the whole um, proposition that you make to people. So part of it is you know how much job opportunity, how much advancement opportunity, how much do you get paid for the job you're doing? So all of those things obviously really matter. Mm. And I've talked a bit about the regulatory space, the quality of government spending, the amount of tax, the attitude from leadership. Um, I think all of that stuff affects that as well as getting people in and also getting investment in. We're very opposed to foreign investment in New Zealand, which is kind of weird because we've got one of the smallest domestic pools of savings and we don't want anything from outside either. Mm. So that, that really holds us back. But there's other things like I think the amount of crime is now an issue for business. Uh, it's not just an expense for people doing business like, you know, your dairy's been ram raided five times. You've got to put up your insurance. Michael Hill, you know, in the annual report showed the impact of robberies on their business. Um, the, these are all issues. Um, but it's also things like I was talking to a school principal who's trying to get some teachers to move from the UK. They open up the Herald. They're like, dude, we're not going there. Like, it's yeah. just every crime, 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 crime. Um, so, you know, getting New Zealand to be safer, that's part of the overall package of attractiveness. Um, and there's another one that some people hesitate to talk about, but 
you know, New Zealand is becoming a global outlier in that the rest of the world is trying to promote, you know, universal human rights, inclusion, science, being outward looking and part of the world. New Zealand is busy trying to say that we are based on a treaty that actually, instead of uniting people with the same rights and duties, which, which by the way, is what the treaty says, uh, instead, we need to have this partnership between races where in order to find out what your role in society is, your right to look after three waters or be consulted on development or whatever, um, you go up with this chain in a, in a hospital, uh, you've got to actually check what your family tree is. Mm. And you might have different rights based on who your ancestors were. And we just say, this country's got to be a place where you have the same rights and duties, whether you've been here for 15 generations or just one. Mm. Um, and so I think it's it's all of those things. It, it is about productivity, regulation, government spending, but you also got to be safe on the streets. You also got to feel that, you know, you are included in New Zealand um, rather than, you know, being sent off and rejected for being the, the from the wrong background. Yeah, yeah. Let's let's move towards um, housing affordability. Um, when Labour went into government, it was one of the big things around making housing more affordable. Mm. Um, the value to income ratio on houses 10 years ago was 5.2 times. Um, as of Q2 2023, it was 7.2 times. Um, the percentage of your income that was going towards making mortgage repayments over the last decade has increased from 31% to 49.4%. And on a study done, we were the seven worth worst uh, country in the world in terms of housing affordability where is it going wrong with housing because it's the kiwi dream right everybody mm. wants to mm. have their mm. little piece of land be able to like you know pay their own mortgage get ahead it mm. feels like that dream's becoming further and further yeah. away so a couple of things first of all there's you know in any market there's supply and demand um, and i am in favor of supply side answers um, most of what we've had from both labor and national in the last decade have been really demand side answers. So, you know, Kiwi Build was really a lottery to purchase houses being built already. Um, if you look at all the changes around tax, bringing in the Brightline test by National, um, if you look at the healthy homes, if you look at the mortgage interest deductibility, um, you know, a lot of this stuff, the loan to value ratios, I mean, just about everything that you've heard, a first home buyer grant, just about everything you've heard. Um, has been about the demand side. Mm. And it's really about using tax and benefits and rules to, and oh, and foreign buyers. So it's, it's been all about trying to change who is sort of the worst victim of this housing shortage, not address the core issue that there's a shortage. So when I talk about supply side, I think fundamentally, one of New Zealand's competitive advantages for attracting people, like just going back to your earlier question, is that we have this enormous piece of land I mean, you know, it's it's huge. It, it, New Zealand doesn't look big on the map because it's next to like the Pacific Ocean and Australia, <laughs> which are two of the biggest things on the planet. But really, New Zealand is if you if you like plonk New Zealand on top of Europe, it's enormous. Mm. Um, so we got space. We got a beautiful place. We got a moderate climate, and yet somehow we have totally failed to make habitat for humans in this enormous land. And so we've got to get better at building the infrastructure that connects it up together. And that means sharing half the GST on, on construction with the local council. So they get some cash for the pipes and an incentive to allow construction because they get the money if they let you build stuff. Mm. Right now, councils get no cash for the pipes, but they get all the liabilities if you build something in their area. So councils are like, don't build here, basically. Yeah. That's a big problem. The um, fact that we don't have a wide range of vehicles for raising cash and building infrastructure. So a lot of parts of the states where the states are generally has very affordable housing, you can raise a bond um, to pay for all the pipes and roads and all the parts of a new development. And then the people that live there will pay an extra rate to pay off that bond over the, over maybe 30 years. Now, if some people say, I don't want to pay that, okay, fine. But if it means that more houses are available and more affordable, maybe mm. that's maybe we should have that option. Um, similarly, uh, you know, we don't we don't really do tolls. We don't really allow um, you know outside investors to build roads privately and toll them for thirty years and give them back. So we're not thinking outside the box about how to get more stuff built. Next thing is our Resource Management Act. Too many people have too many rights to object to too many things for too many reasons, and so it's just a country that says no. Um, that's that's rubbish. And then finally, construction. You know, 
people wonder, oh, expensive jib board, but basically got one type of plaster board in New Zealand. I mean, what's wrong with this country? Mm. Um, and the reason is that there are 67 different building inspections in New Zealand. That's the 67 different councils. And they're all terrified because of what happened with leaky buildings, that if they let anyone build anything, it might leak or fall down and then the council will be liable again, which is what happened in the 90s and early 2000s. So they're saying, okay, we're just going to regulate up the wazoo anyone that tries to build absolutely anything. And of course, the more involved councils get in doing the building inspections, the more stuff they're responsible for. So we say, look, councils are a weird organization to do quality assurance on building. We say, if you want to bring in Japanese building technology, say, you know, materials, techniques, if you can get that insured and certify it in your own way and give a guarantee to the purchaser, then that's okay. You know, you, you, you don't have to go through the council process. And I think if we were to start thinking outside the box about infrastructure, about resource management, about building inspections, then suddenly we could have a way faster development process way more supply, way more housing, way more affordability, we'd just generally be in a better place. Mm. And that's one of the most important things that New Zealand can do. Yeah, why, why do, you, do you think the focus on, very mm. interesting, the focusing on demand to the supply, is it just because that's a lot easier, that's an easier, you know, to pull more levers to see what works and supply, there's some bigger, chunkier problems? Why, why do you think that's where the energy's been put? I don't think that Labor and National wanted their whole housing policies to work, to be quite honest. Um, I think that they know that when house prices go up, um, people who own houses vote, and when house prices go up, they're generally happy. Um, so, and I, you know, I think the, the Nats, when we were in government, almost admitted that. Um, now, you, you know, certainly the UK's had the same issues. So, I think it's partly that they just don't want to. Um, they don't want to uh, fix the problem. Uh, because it's politically unpopular. Mm. Second issue is um, it is just much harder, as you suggest, to deal with um, the supply side. You've got to do tough stuff around regulations, infrastructure funding formulas. Whereas if you just say, oh, well, we'll give 30 grand to every first home buyer. Well, that's easy. You just yeah. phone up the IRD and say, look, if someone buys a home, check their paperwork. And if, it's, if it checks out, give them 30 grand. Mm. Anyone can do that. Mm. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, the... The interesting thing when it comes to to housing, I guess, as well, in terms of a bigger piece, is there's is the gap between the rich and the poor is only going in one way. It's getting wider and wider over time. If you look look in the future, do you think that that right to, to be a home buyer will exist in the future? Or do you think New Zealand will move towards a place, potentially like other parts of the world, where we'll have larger and larger percentage of Kiwis that rent long term? Well, the, I know when people say, oh, we'll just make it easier to rent. It's like, you just sort of given up already. Like, I mean, if you want to rent, that's fine. I've rented for most of my life. And I just think of it as accommodation, as a service, like much more logical than what I do now, actually owning a home that's mm. a pain in the ass. Um, so, you know, I don't have anything against renting, but I, I also think most people in general do actually want to become a homeowner. And in a land that is beautiful, great climate, stunning place to live, practically uninhabited, all we got to do is build some roads and connect it all up and change the law so you're allowed to develop your property and then you know maybe deregulate some of the building inspections so you can find more innovative ways to get stuff built cheaper um, and and better probably if you look at New Zealand houses versus the rest of the world. Um, you know, none of this is hard, so let's do it. Yeah, well, let's talk about owning a home being a bit of a pain in the ass. Landlord bashing. Um, if we, when you look at bond lodgement data, it shows that 80% of landlords own one property and they own the house because they want to have a nice retirement. They want to get ahead. They want to be able to help their kids. Um, we've got nearly 2,000 property investors on our on our books and the, the, the sentiment around landlords being greedy, um, you know, keep, you know, the, the, slumlords keeping all of these properties and get, making these horrible conditions. Um, why do you think property investors in New Zealand have such a bad reputation when we know that they're needed? Like you you, you can't have um, a housing supply with just social housing. The amount of money that a government would have to spend to make that work doesn't make any sense. So, so why do they get bashed on like they do? Yeah, I think the problem is not just restricted to landlords. I think we have a tall poppy problem in general. Uh, you know, in New Zealand lexicon, they think entrepreneur is, is sort of a sinister word, like they're sort of up to something. 
Um, I think we generally have an issue in New Zealand that not everyone, but a sizable minority, including people who are good at getting into political power, um, who like politics, um, those people uh, seem to have a deep distrust of anyone doing well. They always assume that you must have somehow put one over me or pulled the wool over my eyes somehow. So it's partly cultural, I, I think. We need more celebration of success in New Zealand. Um, but with landlords in particular, I mean, this current government has just totally misunderstood that the relationship between landlords and tenants is, is actually symbiotic, it's win-win. So every time they put another rule or another tax or another restriction on landlords and make it less attractive to rent a house out to another human, then fewer people do it and it gets harder for the very people they're trying to help, i.e. tenants. This is just insane, but that is what Labour have basically left us with. So I'm, um, I, I think we just need to, again, define the problem and run as hard as you can in the other direction. Uh, we need to bring back no-fault evictions. Um, we need to restore mortgage interest deductibility. From day one, like I'm talking about 1st of April next year, an Axe alternative budget shows how we could do that. Um, you know, we need to get rid of the bright line test, not take it back to two years so Labor, you know, National puts it down to two so Labor can put it up to 10 in nine years' time. I mean, mm. that's just crazy. Um, we need to actually get rid of bad rules, not just tweak them um, and, and change that whole attitude towards them. I think probably the other thing, just to finish, is that um, landlords have become kind of collateral damage in the housing shortage. So what I always say to people is you, you don't want to punish landlords. You want to make more of them. Mm -hmm. You want to make it easy to build a house and become a landlord because then as a tenant, you have choice and competition. That's how you get better quality, more affordable accommodation, not putting more rules and regulations on the ever dwindling group of people trying to help you. Yeah. And, and when you look at, you know, the property investors that, that we talk to, so many of them, I go, your rent's a bit low. And they go, oh, we've got good quality tenants. They've been there for a long time. We want to look after them. But you're starting to run the cash flows on these properties and they're getting uglier and uglier. There's more and more risk. Um, you'd be insane to manage a property yourself with trying to go through the tribunal and all of those sort of things. So there is a real risk that we end up with more people um, in motels and short-term mm. accommodation because mm. at a certain point, people are going to you know, pull pen right and just yep. go, I've, I've, I've had enough. I don't want to do this anymore. Yep. And that's, you know, it, it, when, when I heard Jacinda say that she was getting rid of mortgage interest deductibility to, quote, tilt the market towards first-home buyers, I just thought, just think through the logic here, Jacinda. I mean, it wasn't always her strong suit, frankly, but, um, you, you know, first-home buyers almost by definition have not owned a house before. So chances are that means that they are tenants. Uh, so they are renting off a landlord, and you're going to put a tax onto a landlord and in a tight rental market, that landlord is going to pass that tax on to a tenant who we earlier established as a first home buyer. So, you know, if Jacinda says she's going to help you, mm. be very, very afraid. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think that applies a lot with property investors are essentially running a small business, right? And it's the same with, with business owners when you look at if you increase um, sick leave or if you increase minimum wage, if you're adding mm. additional costs to anybody, then they have to turn back around and go, well, I have this additional cost. What? Who am I going to pass it on to? Hmm. And then if you're on the fringe going, am I not going to hire an employee? Am I going to hire an employee? You're probably going to lean to to not hiring an employee. And the unemployment number, hmm. while staying very low at the moment, you know, sentiment around a lot of businesses is they are reviewing, you know, kind of what they're doing and going, should we should we be looking to make some trims in the current environment? Well, it, yeah, I mean, it, it, there's only so much energy in the world and you know, wasteful government spending, excessive government regulation, um, talking people down, uh, those are the kinds of things that just set the energy and drain the joy from life. And unfortunately, uh, that is the effect uh, that this government's approach has had. Um, and the other thing I don't like about it is that it's actually divisive. So like when you when your framework for thinking about an issue is there's probably some bad people and some good people, and we're going to intervene on the side of the good people. And that's mm. everything from supermarkets to landlords to small businesses to, you know, what you name it, firearm owners, farmers. There's always a villain of the peace with Labour, and that's why there needs to be rules put in place. And I think that sort of subliminal messaging for six years um, has really beaten people down, and it's time to bring back a bit of light. Yeah, yeah. Let's um, change again and talk about... Uh, Nationals proposed policy around you know 
reintroducing the $5 prescription so we can fund those 13 cancer drugs that are available. Um, uh, you know, there's over a thousand give a little pages in New Zealand related to health where people, you know, have been stuck with uh, finding a treatment that they weren't mm. expecting. Mm. And when you think about, um, when you think about all of those people that are on, on those lists, mm. um, we talk to a lot of them and we talk to, you know, you know, We've got a mortgage, you know, our main income earner has been impacted, having to think about selling their home, whatever it might be, um, having access to to treatment so they can get better. What, what do you think of this policy? Um, well, there's, there's really three kind of parts of it. So first of all, um, you know, should you pay something for medicine? Uh, if you can, then absolutely should. And most people can. Uh, you know, there'll be people that, that can't do five bucks on the script. Um, apparently about 3% of prescriptions aren't picked up, and I'm no doubt some of those are people that couldn't afford the five bucks. Mm-hmm. Um, but by and large, I think, you know, medicine's valuable. You should pay something for it. And, you know, having even a $5 charge nets the government about $160 bucks. So if you ask yourself, what, what's the best use of $160 million? bucks? Would it be free prescriptions for everyone, including millionaires? You probably wouldn't say that was the best use. Mm. Um, next question is, is it funding um, more pharmaceuticals? Um, I would argue yes. Um, you know, I, I'd also argue that you could make the case that we should fund GPs more because I suspect more people are missing out on scripts because they never actually get to the GP to get it, get the script written. Mm. Um, but that would be another another argument. Um, then you come to this question of well, you know, so there's better uses for it, no doubt. Then you get to this question of well, how should pharmaceutical funding work? Um, the Nats are saying well, we are going to choose the drugs that are on the cancer control agencies list. Um, instead of what Pharmac are funding. Um, now, I would argue that that's a very, very dangerous route to go down because you're going to end up with a situation where people know deep down that politicians are deciding, you know, are we taking a Pharmac drug or a cancer control agency drug? People say, I'm going to die if you don't fund this drug. Mm. Um, and in the end, you get to a point where it's the people that run the best political campaigns that, that get to live. I mean that's 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 where that's, that's where it grim. is. Yeah. So I think you know while Pharmac has serious problems, needs serious reform, needs to be opened up. Um, that that you know I, I don't know that where the Nats want to go is actually very wise. Um, having an arm's length mathematically defined formula for funding drugs actually means that you get the best outcome overall, even if it is. It's grim, but it was always going to be grim. Mm. Um, and then you don't introduce the politics. And I'll just give you a story that might sum that up for you. I had a constituent a while back. Um, she was a um, she had head and neck cancer. And she said, I wish this was in my breast. Mm. Because, you know, and not to take anything away from, from breast cancer, but they have run a really, really successful advocacy. I mean, I do a pink ribbon breakfast every, mm. every year. Um, but, you know, does that mean that, you know, she should get less attention because she doesn't have a high profile type of cancer? Um, and um, I think that that's, that's one of the reasons why, you know, politicians picking and choosing is not a place you want to go to. Here's the, here's the biggest issue here, though, is this. Um, yes, New Zealand is low down on the pharmaceuticals available. But we're also low down on productivity. We're low down on incomes. Australians earn 40% more. Um, they pay more tax as a result, even though their actual tax rates are often lower. Um, and that means that you know their government budget for drugs is bigger. And so people are worried about this. I see this patient voice advocacy saying, um, you know, we want to keep up with the OECD. I'm like, me too. But if the economy is not keeping up with the OECD, drug funding is not going to either. So ultimately people that care about this, which is basically everyone, need to start thinking about economic growth. Getting those two things to link for the average person is... Um, I, I, I've got it, more it faith. Makes, I've got it, faith in the average person more, more than you by the sounds of it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I, where people, um, you know, the, the link between economic growth and who's benefiting from economic growth, mm. where that idea of, you know, selfish business owners, selfish property investors versus actually rising tide lifts all boats that's mm. where the the mentality needs to go to but it just feels a, a long way away from that at the moment well let me put it this way um 
when Helen Clark was elected, um, the average, or sorry, when, when, when John Key was elected, uh, the average Aussie earned 11 grand more than the average Kiwi. Mm. Um, when uh, John Key was elected, sorry, when Jacinda Ardern was elected, it was up to a 17 grand difference. Now it's a 23 grand difference. Mm. So, you know, that gap keeps getting bigger. And that means Aussies can afford many more things. Yep. One of those things is life saver cancer drugs. And that's why, you know, if we, we if we're serious about being a first world country, we got to got to ask ourselves, what are we doing about economic growth? Yeah, not yeah. enough. Yeah, I, I, I know you're a busy man. So I'll ask you a couple of questions Sorry. before I let you go. Um, superannuation. So, mm. you know, famously, you know, a couple of months ago, France was on the, um, you know, the French were on the streets mm. um, uh, going against kind of changes to superannuation. Um, it's not an area that any politician feels like they want to touch. Uh, in terms of changing the New Zealand superannuation age, and I understand why that it would be would it be unpopular. Um, but if you think about in the 1950s, it was about four um, children were being born, mm. and now it's about one 1.8 to every couple. Um, there's going to be a lot more old people and a lot less young people. That looks like they're going to be popping them up. We've got an aging population. People are living mm. longer. Mm. Um, how how are we d- does does uh, the government need, need to give that responsibility of deciding what happens to superannuation to an independent third party? Like, how are we going to have a proper conversation around what happens with superannuation in the future? Oh, easily. I mean, first of all, I, I don't like the idea that, you know, democracy doesn't work, voters can't be trusted, politicians can't be trusted, but some other person can be trusted, like mm. this independent third party. Who even is that? Who chooses who that person is? How do they think? How do we hold them accountable? So, you know, there's always going to be, um, you know, as long as you're committed to democracy, you have to trust voters, you have to trust the people they elect to, to make the right decision. Now, um, you may not be aware, but actually, um, X being very clear on this. You know, our alternative, we're the only party that publishes a fully costed alternative budget. And amongst many uh, other initiatives, um, it says that we will raise the age of entitlement to New Zealand superannuation by two months each year for 12 years until it hits 67 and then index it to life expectancy. Uh, What that means is that if you're someone who's, say, 60 now, instead of retiring in five years, you retire in five years and 10 months. Mm. So, you know, it's not exactly so. Instead of retiring in, say, um, September 2028, uh, you'd, you'd be eligible to get national super in May 2029. I mean, it's not a big, mm. you know, it's, it's, a, it's a change, but it's not, it's not a major, major issue you wouldn't have thought. Mm. Um, and we show that in the 12 year transition period alone, the cost to the taxpayers reduced by $16 billion. So it's, it's serious money. It's yep. not just like, you know, cancel a few consultants or don't design a bike bridge. This is real money, billions yep. and billions and billions. Um, so we're very open about that, and I think people who, you know, want to see that sort of courage, want to see that sort of honesty, we've always been like that, um, should give their party vote to act. Um, uh, so yeah, I, 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 I don't know. Maybe you didn't know that was our policy, but we certainly have been saying that pretty openly for years and years. Yeah, I, I, I feel like it's not a conversation that's happening, happening enough, mm. um, and when we're talking to people and building financial plans, pretty much mm. anybody under 50, we build their plans assuming that they're not going to receive um, seat, receive New Zealand superannuation mm. in the future. What, what are your thoughts around means testing? Do you think means testing has a, a place in New Zealand? Um, no, it, it's effectively a more progressive taxation. Mm. But, you know, I mean, already, if you are in the top 5% of taxpayers, you pay a third of all income tax. Mm. Um, you know, if you're in the bottom third of income tax payers, you pay only 8% of all income tax. So we've already got a system where a tiny number of people carry the can, get whacked harder uh, than anyone else. And then you say, right, when you retire, we're effectively going to take away your super because so it's more taxation on, mm. on having done well. Mm. Um, so I, I don't support means testing. I think it's unfair, basically because of the way that the expectation has been built up since however long ago, 1975, or nearly 50 years now. Um, However, I also think that, you know, when it comes to the winter energy payment, um, something that's been introduced very recently and I think is, you know, questionable merit, but it's there and it looks like it's going to stay, um, that should certainly 
um, be means tested just for the simple fact that uh, we're not going to balance the books. So look, super, I think, has got to stay. People have built up an expectation to take it away now is unfair on a means testing basis. But winter energy payment, I, I think, should should uh, be means tested. KiwiSaver contributions, do you think mm. they should be mandatory? God, no, no. Uh, I, I, I mean, I'll, it, there's a controversial opinion, and I'll lose some people on this, but hear me out. Um, KiwiSaver has not increased saving. Uh, KiwiSaver has meant that a lot of people have an account with a big amount of money, and they oh, look at that. Mm. Um, but what is not accounted for is that because of KiwiSaver, uh, there's a lot of people right now who'd be better off to cash it out and pay off their mortgage because their mortgage interest rate is higher than their KiwiSaver returns. Um, so, you know, KiwiSaver is uh, money that you've got in the bank because you didn't pay down other debt, and that can be credit cards as well. Uh, KiwiSaver has also taken a vast amount of government subsidies, you know, about a billion dollars a year, $500 a person, I think it is, for a couple of million people. Um, so, you know, that's another example of where, um, you know, it looks good, but actually you've got to subtract that. You paid that tax so they can give it back to so you, put it in your KiwiSaver. That's not really getting you anywhere. Um, and so the people that have really looked into this in detail will say it's, it actually hasn't effect, had any effect on saving. Yeah, I think on on, on the flip side, that the tricky piece is it's when that light bulb goes off that I'm not going to live in the moment, I'm going to start thinking and planning for retirement. And you could easily argue that that's on the individual to make that that choice. Um, but on average, probably people come to me around 50 and go, mm. uh, you know, I'm now starting to think and realise I'm not going to work forever. And that gives you with very little time opposed to um, – helping people plan long term you know i was talking to my sister in australia and talking about you know that we are under prepared for retirement and she goes oh really people are not going to because she's been contributing you know nine ten percent for such a long period of time towards australian superannuation yeah so i i get what you're trying to say that it's a psychological change and it's oh australia's got and they're doing so well but again, this is this is a false argument. Um, you know, the Australians have higher savings rates, yes, uh, but they also have a different economy. They're also much wealthier. They mm. save more money for that reason. Uh, New Zealanders, on the other hand, um, are, are not actually as bad at saving as people make out. If you look at New Zealand's consumption of foreign goods and services versus its export of goods and services, uh, the last 30 years, New Zealanders have actually been consuming less um, than they then, oh, sorry, producing uh, more than they consume, consuming less than they produce. Um, so we actually, as a country, have been net savers for a long time. Uh, similarly, if you say, oh, what about the current account deficit? Well, in large part, that's because of um, you know financial debt rather than actual trading and consumption day to day, uh, a lot of which was actually built up um, you know, more than 30 years ago. So once you drill down into this stuff, mm. you, you know, I, I understand the psychological element and you want people to think about it earlier. But just remember, if they started earlier in life doing something that didn't actually uh, improve their overall saving because it was just displaced by other debt, then that's not necessarily um, a, a particularly good thing. And the other way you look at it, you know, whenever you, you see these financial advice programs, um, and there was one in Britain with this tough, hard-ass guy in like military uniform, and these poor people are like eating chips all day, and they come in and be like, you know, you guys are gonna save some money, <laughs> and um, th they always had savings and a credit card. Yeah, and he would say, look, you know, I know you're attached to your savings, but you've got to pay off your credit card, then you have no money, but at least you won't have this debt. Mm. And in a way, KiwiSaver is sort of the crutch against a lot of people who actually have debt. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean. Listening to this, there's lots of things that need to um, improve, and, and some people might go, "Oh, you know." Coming back to you know, I guess thinking about New Zealand and what does the future look like? What at, at the moment? What what are you excited about? With you know, where where are we going to leave it on a positive note? Where are we going right at the moment? What what's exciting? Look, I I don't think there is a lot to to celebrate right now, um, but there is a lot to hope for. Uh, New Zealand goes through these phases. Um, the last time we went through a phase like this in the early 80s, we had Muldoon, terrible government, big debt, we had inflation, we just had massive problems right across the board. And a lot of people left, you know, in 1980, 2.5% of the population emigrated in one year. It mm. really was the last one out, turn off the lights sort of kind of territory. Mm. Um, and yet, 
uh, you know, New Zealand had a reform period. Um, it reinvented itself. And if you think back to the 90s, the early 2000s, you know, up until sort of maybe the mid-teens or a bit, a bit earlier, New Zealand was just kick-ass. Like, it was a great place. It was such a red, it was the America's Cup. And you think about the cultural revolution, the music, think about clothing brands like Huffa. New Zealand, you know, a whole wave of immigrants from around the world started choosing New Zealand, investing in New Zealand. New Zealand had a fantastic period. And I think that we're in for a tough few years. I think the government's books are going to be bad. I think we've got some big cultural issues to resolve. Um, and I think we're going to have to have some honest conversations about where we're up to as a country. But I also know that we've been in this situation before, not just in the 80s, the 1930s, and, and previous periods, the 1890s, arguably around the time of the treaty, we could have gone either way. But New Zealand has a habit of reinventing itself as a more awesome country. And I think that will happen again. Uh, just it's going to be a bumpy couple of years. Sounds like uh, you're going to be a very busy man. Mm. Um, really appreciate you coming on. Uh, also, just on a side note, uh, whether you know, you're left, you're right, whichever way you go, the best uh, social media in the game by far. Oh, definitely, get a, definitely get a good laugh on it, that. It's very kind. Well, if you want more social media or if you actually just want real change and some better values in government, give your party vote to act, you get both. Mm, great. Okay, thank you very much for joining us. Please give us a sub, give us a review and a like, and we'll catch you next time.